All right, chapter seven is going to combine some of the concepts from chapters four, five, and six. We're gonna be building on those concepts and we're going to learn a process, one of the major processes that all cells do called cellular respiration. We learned about some other processes that all cells do um, you know, making proteins, um, intracellular digestion, secretion, but this is another one. And understanding cellular respiration is very fundamental to understanding how all cells work and prioritize and manage their energy and their efficiency of managing their energy. So it turns out that this ends up being a really important, of, of all the processes that cells do, it's, it's a very important one, and one that will continue to pop up in other biology classes. And so as much of it as you can internalize now, the easier that will be in the future if you're gonna continue in biology. So the opening picture is, is an actual energy plant, a building, a, a building that um, transforms thermal energy into electrical energy. It's conceptually what the cell is doing. It's always going to be about transfer and transformation of energy, not creating energy. And that gets back to your first law of thermodynamics, energy cannot be created or destroyed. So what we're going to be looking at is how does the cell get energy from the outside environment and then transfer and transform it into a form that it prefers, which is ATP. And so it's all about transfers and transformations. Some organisms um, build their own organic molecules through photosynthesis, and that process is a transfer and transformation of, of energy, sunlight energy, uh, being transformed into chemical energy. Heterotrophs use organic compounds they get from other organisms, like autotrophs. And we are heterotrophs. Animals are heterotrophs. So we have to get our organic molecules, our chemical energy comes from other organisms. However, it doesn't matter whether you're an autotroph or a heterotroph, once you have organic compounds, organic molecules, no matter if you were able to synthesize them through photosynthesis or whether you had to eat some other organism, once you have those organic molecules, all organisms, so I'm saying plants and animals use cellular respiration to convert, to transfer the energy from the chemical energy in the organic molecule into the chemical energy in ATP. So this is the transfer and transformation that's critical. Let's see if I get a pen here. It's not going. Where's my pen? Well, anyway, right here where it says all organisms, plants, animals, bacteria, all organisms use cellular respiration. And it's a transfer and transformation of energy from the organic molecules. Typically, we talk about sugar, glucose, although other molecules can be used like amino acids, fats, um, and it takes the energy from the bonds. Remember, bond energy is a potential energy. It takes the energy from the bonds of the organic molecules and transfers and transforms that into the energy, chemical energy still in the ATP molecules. So that's, the fundam that's fundamentally what's happening in respiration. That's kind of the, the big picture. We're gonna be looking at a lot of detail but that last statement on this slide is really the big picture. You have to keep track of the big picture so you don't get buried in all the details.
All right, this is ATP. We looked at this structure before. Um, ATP has three phosphate groups. The gamma phosphate group is the one on the end. And that's the one that's typically broken off. The breaking of that bond that releases that gamma phosphate is what releases the energy from ATP. And then that gives you, that leaves you with ADP and what we call PI or inorganic phosphate. ADP can be combined with inorganic phosphate in an endergonic reaction to rebuild the ATP. But ATP is the energy currency of the cell, meaning it's the, it's the type of energy the cell wants for its immediate needs. But that's not how energy comes into the cell initially. Energy typically is, starts off in the form of something like glucose or amino acids or fats. And so respiration is how the cell can transfer that energy from the glucose or the amino acids or the fats into making this bond in the ATP, this phosphate bond. Okay, cellular respiration, when we go into more detail, we're going to deal with what we call electron carriers. So molecules that carry electrons, so they accept electrons, and then they take them somewhere and they release them somewhere else. So the purpose is just to carry the electrons from one place to another. And when a molecule accepts electrons, we call that reduction. So when a molecule takes electrons from somewhere, that molecule is reduced, which it seems a little counterintuitive because the molecule is actually getting slightly bigger, I guess you could say. But reduced refers to the charge of the molecule. The charge of the molecule is reduced because electrons have a negative charge. And so the charge of that receiving molecule goes down, becomes more negative when it accepts those electrons. And so we call that reduction. And the molecule that gives away electrons, any molecule that gives away electrons or releases electrons, that's called oxidation. So reduction happens when something accepts electrons or gains electrons. Oxidation happens when something releases or gives away electrons. So in any transfer of electrons, there has to be one part of one um, participant that gives away electrons and one participant that receives them. So there's always one party, so to speak, that is reduced and the other party is oxidized. And so because that, you know, that always has to, both of them have to be a part of the reaction, we call that kind of reaction a redox. RED is for the reduction part of it and oxidation, OX, is the other part of it. So one molecule is oxidized and the other molecule is reduced and really what's happening is electrons are being transferred from one to the other. So sometimes when electrons are transferred a proton will kind of come along for the ride and you'll remember that a hydrogen atom is consists of just one proton and one electron. So sometimes when we talk about electrons moving what you'll actually see in a reaction is hydrogen atoms moving but we're focusing on the electron part of that hydrogen atom. So you may see that. One of our um, most, one of the electron carriers we're going to see a lot of in this chapter is called nicotinamide adenosine dinucleotide. And for reasons that are obvious, we just use the abbreviation NAD. So NAD is nicotinamide adenosine dinucleotide when it doesn't have any electrons, when it's not carrying its electrons. And then when it does carry, typically it carries two electrons and one proton. When it is carrying, when it is full, so to speak, or when it is completely reduced, we call it NADH. So NADH is the molecule once it's been reduced, meaning it's it's holding those electrons that it received. 
um, NAD plus is when it doesn't have its electrons. So I usually think of an, uh, an electron carrier a little bit like a little pickup truck. It might have something in the bed of the truck. It might have a load or it doesn't. NAD plus is when it doesn't have its load of electrons. NADH is when it does. And, and NAD plus picks up two electrons and a proton. And at that time it becomes NADH and then it goes somewhere else and it gives away those two electrons and that proton and it goes back to being NAD. So just like a pickup truck picks up a load, carries it, dumps it somewhere else, this molecule alternates between being NAD plus when it doesn't have any electrons, not any electrons, but it doesn't have these particular two that it's carrying, its load, so to speak, and then NADH is when it does have a load. So I like to think about, about it in that way. And here's the molecule, but you don't have to memorize the structure of the molecule, but it's a complicated molecule. Um, shown here on the left is the NAD plus version. Shown here on the right is the NADH version. And when you kind of compare both side to side, they're hardly different at all, except you do notice a little difference with an extra hydrogen and you can see that the plus sign on the nitrogen in the nitrogenous base gets neutralized, but you don't have to know the actual structure. So NAD plus doesn't have two electron doesn't have an extra two electrons and a hydrogen. NADH does. So in cellular respiration, there's going to be a lot of these redox reactions, a lot of reactions where something is going to give away electrons, so it becomes oxidized and something else is going to accept those electrons and it becomes reduced. But typically then that thing that becomes reduced then turns around and gives away the electrons and it becomes oxidized again. So the electrons end up getting just kind of passed down this whole series of steps. All right. Eventually though, they reach what we call the final electron acceptor. So there's a lot of kind of intermediate or middle electron acceptors, but they end up passing those electrons on. But there is a final electron acceptor in this whole process. And we're going to emphasize that quite a bit, what the final electron acceptor is. All right, I haven't told you yet what that is. All right, so the final electron acceptor that we're going to talk about the most, and that's why I put this in boldface, is oxygen. If oxygen is the final electron acceptor, then we refer to the entire process as aerobic respiration. Aerobic means with oxygen. And so that's going to be fundamentally the type of respiration that we're going to go through. It has the most steps, so that's kind of the full length respiration. There is another type of respiration called anaerobic respiration, which is virtually identical to aerobic respiration. The only difference is typically the final electron acceptor at the very end of all the steps, instead of being oxygen, is something else. So something like sulfur. So, you know, so there is, there are some other things that can be final electron acceptors. If it's not oxygen, but it's something inorganic, so something that doesn't have carbon, like sulfur by itself, can be a final electron acceptor. In that case, we would call that process anaerobic respiration because you don't have to have oxygen for that. Right? Obviously, humans, we do aerobic respiration. We must have oxygen. But there are some organisms that don't have to have oxygen. Um, not a huge number, but some. Mostly anaerobic respiration is uh, primarily going to be seen in certain special types of bacteria and um, archaea, which are also prokaryotes. And then fermentation. Fermentation, there are some eukaryotes that do fermentation. Humans can do a little bit of fermentation. In fermentation, you have a final electron acceptor that is an organic molecule. So you guys know that means some kind of carbon-based compound. So that's kind of the distinction between these three terms. 
It really has to do with the details of the final electron acceptor, but all of them involve these redox reactions where these electrons are going to be passed along from one thing to the next and so on and so forth until you get to the very last one, whichever that is, that's the final electron acceptor. All right, like I said, we're going to focus a lot on aerobic respiration. We're going to learn the whole shebang. And remember the whole point of aerobic respiration. Um, sometimes the what we call the summary equation is shown like I've shown here. However, it leaves out probably the most important part of the purpose of respiration. Remember, the purpose of cellular respiration is to transfer the energy from the bonds of an organic molecule, like glucose, to the bonds of ATP. And so when you see this equation here, it's sort of incomplete. But let's, let's address this, and then I'll add a little bit to it to make it complete. Um, what you see here on the far left is glucose. So C6H12O6, that's glucose. See if I can get a pen. I don't know why I can't get a pen in this. Here we go. Okay. So this is glucose here, you probably remember. C6H12O6. Typically, aerobic respiration is shown with glucose as one of the reactants. There are other things that can be reactants, but um, this is kind of the typical equation that we usually use to learn first off. And then when you go into like organic chemistry, or uh, not organic, biochemistry, um, you'll learn alternatives. But we'll touch on that a little bit later. But for now, let's stick with glucose as one of our reactants. And since this is aerobic respiration, we're going to have to have oxygen. So six oxygen molecules. All right. And then this arrow here is bonds breaking and bonds forming, right? For aerobic respiration, this is going to be... I don't know, I'm, I'm just estimating 25 steps, meaning 25 different enzymes. Remember, remember the um, metabolic pathways where each step is catalyzed by a different enzyme, and the product of one step becomes the reactant for the next step. So there's a whole bunch of steps in, that are kind of summarized in this arrow right here. We're going to go through some of them, but not every single step. But in the end product, you get carbon dioxide, which is a waste. For this process, carbon dioxide is a waste. Your body really can't do anything with carbon dioxide. Um, and carbon dioxide represents what's left, what, what's left from the glucose. That's If you're tracking the carbons, that's where the carbon ends up as part of the CO2, which means the sugar that you eat, after it gets the bonds of it get broken to get that energy out of it, the waste car the carbon of that sugar comes out in your breath, which I always think is kind of interesting. So the the breakfast that you ate, the carbohydrates or whatever, the CO2 that you breathe out used to be part of that breakfast. And then water is also um, kind of a waste. It actually comes from the oxygen that you breathed in. The oxygen becomes the water. All right, in this equate in this overview. But what about the energy? Because this is just the matter. Remember matter and energy. So these are just the molecules. What about the energy? Well, the energy is really in the bonds of the glucose. So the carbon to carbon bonds, those are high energy bonds. So where does that energy go? Well, the energy, what's not being shown here, which should be shown, let's see if I can clear this out. Eraser, there we go. What we should add is, what also is involved here is that you have ADP, there's always some ADP available in the cell. Oops, and there's always some inorganic phosphate. That's PI. So that would be reactant on the reactant side. And then on the, re on the product side, 
there's ATP. So the energy from the glucose, the energy that's in the glucose bonds, ends up in the bonds of that phosphate being attached to the rest of the, what is ADP, to become ATP. Now, the actual numbers, usually we say 36 to 38, something like that. So I'm going to say... I'm just going to say 36 ADP plus 36 PI eventually yields about 36 ATP. And we'll talk about why that number can vary a little bit, but it's something in the 30s range. So for any one glucose that gets broken down all the way into individual carbons, we extract enough energy to put into the bond to make 36 ATP. So the glucose is going to be oxidized. So sometimes this process is called the oxidation of glucose because, remember we said oxidation is the um, when something gives away electrons. And what, what, the, uh, what the glucose is giving away, the electrons are in these hydrogens. Remember I said hydrogen plus a hydrogen atom includes an electron and a proton, and it's that electron in the hydrogen atom that's being given away. And initially, all the energy is in those electrons there, all right? They're going to, as the bonds are broken with the carbon, the hydrogens are going to be, the electrons of the hydrogens are going to be transferred. And eventually, um, the energy is going to be stripped away from that glucose and put into making the ATP, all right? So this is an energy coupling because the breakdown of glucose is exergonic. It's a breakdown. Glucose is being broken down into six individual carbon molecules. So you have one glucose at the beginning and you have six separate carbon molecules at the end. So that glucose has been completely broken apart. But there's a building reaction. The building reaction is the ADP plus PI becomes ATP. That's a building reaction. So the energy that's released from the breakdown of glucose is recaptured or taken in by the reaction that builds ATP. So that is an important concept of this whole process. Now, something that we skipped over in Chapter 4, but now we need to kind of remedy, is the structure of the mitochondrion. Because in a eukaryotic cell, this is where the um, reactions are going to take place. And we're going to refer to specific parts of the mitochondrion, so we need to really learn the actual parts. So there's not just the mitochondrion is important, but then there's parts of the mitochondrion. So now we're zooming in and looking very detailed within one mitochondrion. A typical cell probably has, I don't know, 30 or 40 or 50 or 100 mitochondrion. I know in, in, in your book they only show one or two, but that's just because they don't have space for everything. But in a real cell you have lots and lots of these, but we're just going to look at one. So on there are two membranes. The mitochondrion has two membranes, an outer membrane and an inner membrane. It's the same thing with the nuclear envelope. There was an outer nuclear envelope and an inner nuclear envelope. So um, the outer membrane is just what you would expect it, kind of smooth or you know, semi-flattened. But the inner membrane is folded back and forth. So it's kind of like if you think about a raisin, you know, the skin of a raisin that's it's wrinkly like that. I mean, roughly it makes a, an oblong kind of structure, but it's, it's all wrinkly. So that's the inner membrane is all wrinkly and folded like that. The folds are called the Christi. That's, the, that's referring particularly to that folded shape of the inner membrane, the Christi. Um, and then in between the outer membrane and the inner membrane, there's a space. And that space is called the inter, with a T, intermembrane space, meaning between 
the outer and the inner membrane. Inter means between. Like an interstate highway goes between states, goes from one state to the next. So inter means something is between two things. So the intermembrane space is the space between the outer membrane and the inner membrane. And then there's the space that's enclosed by the inner membrane. The very center space is called the matrix. I, I don't know why they name, you know. I didn't, make, I didn't pick the names, so you just have to memorize them. So I will have you label, I think on the, on the um, practice activities, you'll, you'll label structure of a mitochondria and make sure you can. So there's two membranes and two spaces. Everything outside of the outer membrane is part of the cytoplasm or cytosol. And um, so we're, we're focusing on what's inside the mitochondrion. All right, so, um, so this would be the structure of the mitochondria, two membranes and two spaces. And what's going to be happening really inside the mitochondria is called phosphorylation. And what that means is anytime you have a phosphorylation, that means phosphate is attached to something. And you're going to see phosphorylation we're going to use that term. So phosphorylation means a phosphate group is attached to something else. Sometimes the phosphorylation, sometimes we'll be talking about, for example, ADP. When ADP has a phosphate attached to it, then that is phosphorylation and that makes ATP. But, but the ATP also can release a phosphate and that can be attached to something else, and that's called, that would be, in that case, that protein would be phosphorylated. Phosphorylation means having a phosphate attached to something. So if you guys remember phosphate, you've got to still remember your functional groups. All right, I'm going to take a break here because I've gone through a lot of kind of overview things, and then in the next segment, we're going to put together all the steps of a, mostly aerobic respiration first. That's what's showing on your screen right now, all this, the steps of aerobic respiration. And I've kind of color-coded it, although I had to use dark colors because of, um, I, because of contrast issues, but um, I try to keep this color coding throughout the rest of the slideshow so you know which portion of the process each slide is referring to. But I'm going to stop this part of the lecture right now, and then when you start on the next segment, we'll begin here.